Well, we don't do these things very often. I think it seems to be now that the album, I need a new name for them, but al- album Omnibuses, this is only the second one we've done. And uh, it's another band, another person that the Justin Wayne Show has known since they first started putting out stuff and uh, first started promoting their album. Um, and of course, it's Unquiet Nights. If you haven't already seen that, it's unquietnights.com. The album, 21st Century Redemption Songs, was released 25th of January, two days after my birthday. And the, I think the 25th was the fourth anniversary of the Justin Wayne Show. So it's all sort of come together on this album. And we're really excited to have Luke with us to play the entire album and talk through the album with. So hello, Luke. How's it going? Hello, Justin. Going well. Real pleased to be talking to you. Yeah. We've talked about doing this for a while. I'm glad we finally we finally dug into it and gotten to it. I'm excited. Likewise. You guys have been promoting this for... Uh, you guys have been putting out, out tracks and demos and things and giving them to... It's been a while. It says 18 months in the... Uh, has, it, has it been really that, been that long? It's been all, quite a while. Uh, the first song for the album, I think, was uh, mastered in August 2010. You were, as far as I know... Well, you played it in the first week anyway. So since then, I've been sending you stuff, working towards the album. I'm not even sure at that time if we were definitely going to release a full album or not, but it turned into that. Well, it seems you've done a really good job of echoing all the um, all the publicity that you've got on, on YouTube and on, I think, a lot of the techniques that you've used, a lot of other independent musicians could learn from. Because you've got all the, you've cut all the things, all the times you've been put out and you've put them onto YouTube or you've, you've blogged about them or you put them on your Facebook. You've done a lot of work for us as well. I mean, you've generated a lot of momentum for yourselves and we've been really happy to be a part of it, I think. So you weren't weren't going, thinking about putting out an entire album first. You were just thinking about maybe even maybe a couple of songs or an EP. Because I remember you talking about an EP in the in the early days as well. Well, I was obviously thinking about an album, but uh, you, you're weighing up the money aspects and the time aspects and whether people believe it enough. And it, it sort of morphed into an album, and it made more sense. I don't see the commercial value or point in an EP for a band anyway, because if you're promoting the radio, they want a single. And if you want to make any kind of a profit selling the album, there's a higher profit margin on an album. So, and also, it's if you're a songwriter, an album's the stock and trade anyway. So, well, yeah, you've you've got a lot of um, you had a lot of interesting things to say in the in the um in the liner notes of the album, and we will get to that because you had some quite interesting things to say, and I think uh, being echoed a lot by the independent music community, which is really the album itself is uh, refreshing to see popping up again. But let's play the first track. This track was the first song that we've played, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't it? Burning the tracks. Your track of the week. I'm mistaken. <laughs> I'll have to put the link to that show because that that was pretty cool. It was pretty cool for us as well to to get that sort of exclusive track and stuff like that. We yeah. were excited about it. Do you want to say anything about it before we play it, or should we just chuck it on and talk about it afterwards? I'll let people hear why it got us off to a running start. Cool. Once again, it, the the album is 21st Century Redemption Songs. This is Unquiet Nights with Burning the Tracks.
Once again, Burning the Tracks, the first song of Unquiet Nights ever played on the Justin Wayne show in the first week. We were really excited about it, and um, I know it got to other people that I know. I know Rodrigo de Sa was of the Island Music Show and um, other Cowboy Cantor. He jumped on right away as well, didn't he? Was he another one of the first people that you sent the tracks to when you first started getting this out? I sent them to a lot of people, but he was definitely, along with yourself, one of the first people I remember giving us quite enthusiastic support. And it's always a thrill to hear a DJ talking in um, Rodrigo's own unique accent. Oh yeah, and he's so sincere as well. Like he doesn't he doesn't play stuff he doesn't like, and the stuff that he likes, he's very he loves, and he's very yeah. he just has a very cool way of of presenting. I really like listening to his shows. How did you start your? How did you find people to send stuff to? What was how did you do that when you were first starting out? A uh, shotgun approach, really, volume, volume. So I would just write, I would make a notepad of everyone who was playing independent music or playing any kind of music and blanket them all and some respond, some don't and then you get a better feel of who's going to be receptive to your stuff and who isn't and then obviously when I released more songs, the first people came to mind were the ones who'd already played it so I got it out to them but you have to kind of want to expand infinitely really, keep finding new DJs every week like one's never enough, really, and new countries, new territories. Sure. Well, I think it's it's good to be nice to the ones that have played it, but it's also good, to, like you say, it's good to expand. And I suppose once you've once you've had it on a couple of shows, you can say, oh, so and so liked it, so you you might yeah. like it as well. And then like, oh, well, they did, so maybe I should. Well, I always personally have a special place for the people who helped us gain the early momentum. Some DJs did take a while before they took notice. You kind of know that's the way the music industry works. I mean, personally, I was gonna have more loyalty to the early DJs, but you, st- you can't be content. You can never be content with what you have. You sit on your laurels or whatever they say, right? Some sort of uh, wise Irish poet said that or something, I would have thought. <laughs> we also want to talk about, um, you did a lot of this stuff in Italy. So let's talk about that after we play Trigger Finger, shall we? How does Trigger Finger fit into all this stuff? Because this was a later one in the uh, recording process, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was around halfway. I think it was the fifth or sixth. Okay. Because I'd been back to Ireland again and done a few gigs, and then Trigger Finger was in the pipeline. In terms of being written, I think it was 2009. The order that the songs were recorded for the album really had no bearing on when they were written. Last summer, it was recorded. Cool. Independently, I might add. Yes, of course. Well, you've done the entire thing. You funded the entire thing yourselves, didn't you? Yeah, did. And uh, also, we, we did all, I mean, we never visited a studio. We did all our own recording and oh, wow. just had some outside mixing, just. Okay, cool. Well, let's hear this. This is Trigger Finger. It's on Quiet Nights. The entire album of the 21st Century Redemption songs in the Justin Wayne Show. <laughs>
again, that's Trigger Finger, and you can get the entire album. It's out now. You can get it digitally on iTunes or anywhere else, any other digital retailers. And it's on unquietnights.com. And are there, there are physical copies available now, aren't there? Yes, indeed there are. Good, because you need to send me one, and you need to sign it, because you put me in the liner notes, and I have to say, I don't know if it's every presenter's dream, but certainly us, us independent guys, it's a dream fulfilled every time uh, a band does that for us. So thanks very much for that. Maybe that links a little bit to um, what I'm quite interested in, which is how you found the effort that you've put into this promotion. Because I think a lot of bands overlook the promotion of the, you know, they, they sit in the studio or they spend, you know, thousands of pounds, thousands of dollars or whatever, they, whatever currency they spend on producing the album. And then they just sort of put it out to their, the current fans and they don't do this promotion that you've done. How did you, how did you find the places to submit to and how much effort did you put in, do you think? Well, I put in a lot of effort. It's a, it's a job. Probably making the music and producing the music is a job, and running the record label side or releasing independently is a, at least a twenty-four hour a day job. I always, anytime I'm awake, I have my email account open, and I can see the new emails coming in at the top, and you just have to keep sort of knocking them out every time they come in. Otherwise, it'll just pile up too much, you know, for a human being to look after. Sure. You have to have this kind of expansionist viewpoint where one DJ is never enough, one online publication or whatever it is you're looking for isn't enough. You enter the music industry at absolute zero and you have to realize that every other band's ahead of you. You have to work out what they're doing that you're not and how they're doing it and slowly check off little things on your CV Mm. that you might need to get to the next level or whatever it is you want to see yourself in whatever time frame and if you can't immediately get where you want, if you see it as a series of logical steps, there's always a small logical step which will take you to the next one, whether it's um, starting with podcasts, moving on to regional FM radio, and then you might see yourself taking a stab at national radio. Mm. And uh, the same kind of applies in everything. I mean, if, if all of your online profile doesn't kind of come together at the same time, people don't really want to give you a chance because most people I find want to get the rub of a successful or emerging band, you know, for their own benefit as well. Mm-hmm. They they want to see if you have a, evidence of a fan base. They're more likely to. It's it's just a fact. It is that sort of a, a crowd attracts a crowd sort of a thing. But if you don't have yeah. a crowd, it's hard to build the crowd at first. I suppose yeah. it's uh, one by one, isn't it? Email by email, like you were saying, you just knock them out. Someone yeah. says something, you say something back, and yeah, keep yeah. It up. yeah. Um, see see what way they're talking to you and the tone of it and what they expect of you and try and find a way to be able to give them that next time or to be to be at that level if they it, it's usually through innuendo or you know you have to sort of read between the lines but you get an idea of what what level of a band you have to be or a profile wise before they'll help you out hmm. more or less and if you keep making the right moves something in that direction is going to happen Find something else to do. That was that would be my. <laughs> no, uh, that, that's not. I can move the wrong way. Find something else to do while you're sending emails. If you, if you can listen to music or listen to audiobooks or in some way find it enjoyable, that the actual robotic side of sending, you know, doing this promo. Sure. It isn't your um, your brain's working on two levels, and it's you can do this stuff without really thinking after a while. How much do you personalize the emails that you send out, especially to like radio and? podcasts and things uh, a lot I suppose um, DJs don't really like it that much to get a circular email so I would hyperlink phrases in the email rather than sending a big list of 10 links at the end oh, I would hyperlink good. individual phrases so you're saying hi so and so wanted to let you know that the first album 21st Century Redemption songs then hyperlink the name of the album mm. I usually use my Bandcamp profile or SoundCloud or something like that and then Positive image reinforcement, you might drop in a couple of facts which seem innocuous but are actually reinforcing the idea that you're as big a band as would be the type that they help out. I suppose there's like a... Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. a skill to doing that. What's your biggest success so far, do you think? I mean, aside from the Justin Wayne show, of course. Where else have you... Because it looks like you've got quotes in your bio now from Absolute Radio, which is really cool, and uh, Amazing Radio, which is also fantastic. Yeah, those, yeah, those are good ones. Yeah. But I was I was really happy with the Absolute thing because kind of planned burning the tracks would... I call it my commercial radio nutcracker. Yeah. And 
and that's the way it happened. So really glad. Um, basically, if you can pay for a radio plugger, you have a chance of getting on the playlist. If you can't pay an established radio plugger, you're very likely to be aiming for just spot plays. Yeah. So if you can rack up enough spot plays, then a radio plugger is going to be more interested because the job is sort of done. Right. Or it's a more tangible prospect to get on commercial radio because different people at different times have been negative about whether we or it would get on commercial radio. And I felt that that was more about them just evaluating the online profile at the time hmm. and saying, well, this band isn't making the right moves. They don't have, they're not doing large established tours. They don't seem to have, you know, backing. So it will be very hard for me to do anything with that. Mm -hmm. If you kind of knock down the door to commercial radio a bit, they can't really take the same attitude with you. I was really aiming for that and absolute radio was great. Um, Pete Donaldson played it on his Sunday Night Music Club and uh, the rock show on uh, Amazing Radio as well play it. And that was really a morale boost as well as everything else. Yeah, definitely. Let's play If I Couldn't and You Ever Would. The title is a strange title. So tell us a bit about why it's called If I Could and You Ever Would. Uh, is it just to piss off radio guys when we say it wrong? Or uh? <laughs> I don't think they get that. I, don't th I haven't heard that wrong. I've heard Unique Nights, but I haven't heard If I Would and You Ever Could. Oh, okay. It has a good flow. I mean, I like language. I don't know if I can give a really sophisticated explanation, but I kind of place a lot of stock in titles because I can be put off a song by a really, really boring title sure. or a one, sometimes a one-word title or an abstract title. I like kind of detail-specific songs which evoke something. I mean, before you've even heard the song, your brain is already thinking. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's in a title. Well, I'm trying to do as much as possible, yeah. So. Sounds good. Let's play it. If, if, if I could and you ever would. We'll speak to Luke more in just a minute.
We just did two songs back to back there. That, of course, was We Were the Ones. I was just saying to Luke, one of the shiny radio singles as well. You were saying that um, the song that we're going to play, how much? A little bit later. Oh, it's near the end. Um, Someone's Love on Drugs is a uh, was a song that get, people get turned off by because of the of the title. Maybe it's just because you were you were bold pe- enough to have it as the title. Not people as a whole, just people who work in the shiny radio industry. The shiny radio industry. Yeah, yeah, people who <laughs> people who have press releases on their table and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, the Verve had a massive single, and drugs don't work. Um, but that was a very obviously negative comment about drugs. Right. Nobody says anything about the man with the golden arm, the Sinatra film. It's it's actually not a positive comment about drugs, but because it's not immediately obvious from the title, people just sort of give it a body swerve. Hmm. Well, I think it's brave of you, and it's the song, so that's what the song should be called, right? I mean, that's what the... Yeah. We want to talk a little bit about, we were just having this great off-air conversation about, about you being a PR professional, and uh, I asked you if you had been already. You said you hadn't been. Well, no, I haven't. I couldn't possibly do it as a job because I can only put in this amount of effort into the PR side because it's my own product, my own, I want to see it do well, but a PR professional would probably be a lot more economic with time and probably have a higher success rate and more contacts, so it might not take as much of their time to get the same results as it does for me. That's why I couldn't I couldn't do it for another band, but I have to do it for my own because at the start, nobody else is going to do it. Right. And nobody, exactly. certainly nobody's going to do it unless you have the money to give them to do it, so... It's a good lesson for any independent musician is that they need to do this sort of stuff or it's just going to be, you know, I think there's something to be said about, you know, circling it around people's Facebook friends and formerly on MySpace. And I suppose now there's all other places that can be found and picked up and seen mm-hmm. by people. But uh, as far as getting it onto podcasts and radio and stuff like that, you've got to do that yourself. And PR companies aren't even going to work with you until you've done some of that yourself, are they? No. The more the more of a profile you have, the more willing a PR company will be to talk to, even to reply to your email to even with the pricing, they can accommodate you more if they feel they can definitely benefit from doing something for you. Right. This other thing about PR companies is that they're a business. And at the end of the day, if you come to them and you say, I've got two grand, can you get my you know music out to blah, blah, blah. I mean, they'll if they can do it, they'll say yes and they'll take you no matter what your music sounds mm-hmm. like. But if your music is good they're going to be much more willing to take you because a lot of what PR company deals with is this relationship between them and the radio stations and the podcasts. I mean, the stuff that I get through a lot of times has been, the stuff that I read has been tailored to me and it's been, you know, like they know what the kind of stuff that I play, whereas the stuff that I chuck out is just these blanket emails. It's sad, but I know that there's PR companies that people pay lots of money to that just send out blanket emails and it's, it's just a waste. But sorry, sure. this is a, we're interviewing you and not me. <laughs> but you, you've done a very good job yourself. You really caught on quickly to the fact that we don't respond to blanket emails. But there is, like you were saying, there is a science to how much you personalize and how much is just copy and paste from a mm-hmm. notebook file, right? I think it's okay to have a... T- I mean, would you be personally offended as a DJ if you knew that the email had been formulated from a template and well, personalized for you? A lot of the information is going to be the same. So no, I, I, I completely understand that. And doing the PR for my own show and stuff like that, I have there is part of it that you just copy and paste. But there's the bit at the top where you've mm-hmm. done maybe a just you know five minutes. It doesn't take that long. Five minutes of research, right? I mean, you look at yeah. their site, you see what kind of music they play, and you, you listen to five minutes of a show that they might have recorded, and you say, I like your show. This is what I liked about it. Here's my stuff. Here's the uh, copy and paste bit. So, mm-hmm. you sort of have to just go on instinct, really. If you feel a certain DJ would respond to a couple of lines of personalization, or if you feel you need to really sell yourself, yeah, in a very specific. If they have criteria that you need to hit, right? You know, you need to in a, in a subtle and quick way let them know how you meet that criteria. Hmm. Doing it effectively in, in a few lines is important because. People get a lot of emails a day. They don't want to read a life story. Right. By name dropping or you know, ane- saying something anecdotally or something at the start of the email, you um, you're breaking down a barrier. Hmm. It's really b- common sense. I feel kind of guilty trying to trying to say that this is anything new. It's just common sense. Yeah. Really. Um. That's a it's a whole lot of common sense. But it's important to actually do these things because some people think that they're so so simple that they're not even worth doing. That's true. Yeah. So you just have to be there and do it. Put the effort in. (laughs) Yeah. 
cool. Be prepared to fail as well. You yeah. can't say yeah, I'm not going to contact that DJ because there's no way they're going to play us, and they're we're not we're not that level. You know, you have to be prepared to say, well, okay, I know that maybe they won't, but maybe they will as well. Yeah. But I mean, send the email and forget about it. Mark it down so that you know you've sent it. L lose emotional stake in it once you've sent it, and don't be let down if they don't reply because sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes real life gets in the way, and they just haven't replied because they haven't replied. It's true. Do you do follow-ups on some of the big ones that you um, you hope to get in? Well, sometimes it's a follow-up. Sometimes it's just uh, the next six months later. It's a start from scratch again. You know, sure. they, you figure they didn't even they don't even remember that you have spoken to them before. Yeah, I think we should um, we need to talk about how you've produced this album in Italy and in Northern Ireland and in rooms and all that sort of stuff because I think some of the because you've complete, done this completely independently. There's going to be a lot of our listeners that are going to be wanting to know how, how all that went as far as the music is concerned. But let's play another song before we continue. It's um, As We Go Along. This is number five on the album, Silent Picture Show. This was another later. This is maybe the second to last of the last. Because I know the, no, the last no, no. one was the last one on the album, wasn't it? Um, Silent Picture Show was either fifth or sixth song. Oh, okay. Um, it was just again. after. Remember um, we met at Scala last year? That's true. That's April, right. Yeah. And we had so the we had the um, Android versus iPhone war of trying to take a picture. <laughs> well, this is a laugh. I I hear you say this on your show every time, but I actually don't own an iPhone and never have used one. Oh, it was actually a guy, Dan, uh, Dan George. Hello, Dan, if you're listening. He came from Devon, uh, and he was sitting across the table from you. And I think somehow maybe your iPhone, <laughs> his iPhone, got into conflict with your Android or who, whatever it is. Whatever these silly things are. Um, <laughs> He's smart. You, yeah, you were talking about battery life, and uh, <laughs> I actually just have a very simple phone, and it wasn't me, Gov. Fair enough. Okay. Well, glad we, glad we cleared that up. <laughs> Luke of Unquiet Nights does not have an iPhone. does not endorse Apple or iPhone products in any way. <laughs> this is Silent Picture Show.
That was Should Have Said Something, another song that we played a long time ago on the show. And obviously this, we just mentioned briefly about the new mastered editions instead of the old ones. And you've, you guys have, since you've done the demos, some of these older songs, you've redone a lot of the work in recording and stuff, haven't you? Yeah, we did. Um, the only song which was released to radio or to podcasts, which isn't the finished master, was Should Have Said Something. Okay. All yeah. right. There was plenty of demos though, but they were never released. Um, but that song gave us some trouble. And uh, when I first moved to Italy, I didn't have any. I didn't have an electric guitar with me, so I was kind of left with these whatever I had recorded on my hard drive before I left. Oh. So I, I made should have said sort of cut and paste out of texts which I'd done in my old studio in Ireland, and um, it kind of felt we were getting uh, some publicity off the early songs because it should have said was the fourth that we did. 
and there was a, a, an amount of pressure from DJs and stuff or you know you felt it too they're playing us so it'd be good if we had something else to play mm-hmm. so I mastered or got should have said mastered but it, in retrospect the guitars didn't sound good enough so we left it till September of 2011 and uh, did it again and redid all the guitars and I, I brought my guitar over uh, the Stratocaster because it folds into two pieces in the suitcase and uh you put this, you took the strat apart and put it in. Yeah, in yeah, two yeah. The body, took, took the neck off the body and put it in the suitcase. Wow. And, uh, I took it deadly and recorded the rest of the album, like the, the last six songs with that, and very happy with it. The the new shit I said is much better, as I think you commented whenever you played it. Well, I mean, it's a good song. I mean, the the song is re- well written. So I mean, I think you could record it with an acoustic guitar and you sing it into a microphone, and it would sound, you know, it'd be just as good. So it, it definitely sounded like there was a lot more work. Not, not that cutting and pasting a song isn't a lot of work, because I'm sure that was a heck of a lot of work as well. Yeah, yeah, well, there's still an amount of computer editing, even if you do, you know, a whole take, but the new should have said, I'm really happy with it, and it got played on BBC as soon as it was done, and very happy with it. People talk about it as being a good radio song, you know, people like to play it, so uh, it sounds much better anyway. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I, I like the first one more, I don't, and I'm, I'm happy that this one's made the album. Yeah. So. It cost a bit more money and took a bit more time, but I'm much happier now as a result. Well, I think, you know, there's something something I read into as well is that people send demos. I think that the demo of uh, Should Have Said Something was ready to send. So I'm not saying this is the case with this song, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of bands that'll just record like a mediocre vocal track or just, you know, they'll, they'll send out something that has mistakes in it to me and to podcasts and stuff. And I send them back an email that says, this is a great demo, but it's not ready for radio. And I think that bands need to be aware of this is that you don't want to send <laughs> crappy stuff to radio because either they'll hear it and think you're crap and not play it, not pl- mm-hmm. ever talk to you again, or they'll play it, which is probably worse because then you got people out there thinking, people out there thinking that you're crap, especially if you're not. Or obviously there's a learning process. I'm sure that the stuff, the stuff that you probably recorded, Luke, is you know years and years ago, isn't half as good as the stuff it is now. I mean, you grow as an artist, you grow as a player, you grow as a singer, and I think that time and money spent on the recording process can be can be really well worth it sometimes. It certainly is. It was a, a learning curve even throughout the album. Never mind what was done before the album. Uh, I don't. I mean, I worked really hard on burning the tracks, and we were the ones which were well. They were the first two songs, to, you know, to make them a radio statement. Hmm. Um, I remember working very hard, but it feels now like I'm just very fortunate that it came out in such a way that radio really receives it well. So it was a long time ago. I mean, it, we we started that album two years ago, so or more. I learned a lot of things, got some new equipment, and the recording process changed. Uh, towards the end of the album and maybe it got a bit easier or I knew you know I knew more about the plugins I was using and knew how to remove a lot of unwanted frequencies and sure. you know get it more of a more clean and I, I wasted less time on the last songs than I did at the start well let's talk about the equipment in a minute but let's play song of lust this one is a nobody wants to know nobody wants to know the song of lust no oh. no it's um, well if you're doing it sequentially it would be oh. nobody wants to know dear goodness I've skipped one sorry about that Nobody wants to know. So, why does nobody want to know? Um, I didn't want to abandon my blues roots, so I did a kind of a blues song, a more more simple lyrically. But I just wanted to speak in those terms, hmm. like a blues guy. Yeah, cool. Which um, which I started off as, and still play guitar in that way. But it's not all. You don't want to play the same song every time. And you don't want to. You don't want to write the same song or record the same song. But it's good to to go deeply into one thing, one genre. Well, let's hear it. Nobody wants to know. Unquiet Nights, 21st Redemption songs. If you haven't picked it up yet, unquietnights.com.
just a lie What you gonna do when you find out all along You've been tricked, those dirty days ain't gone Again, nobody wants to know, since we've got it in the actual order. I tried to go out of order, but Luke corrected me. Thank you very much, sir. We, we haven't really talked much about much about influences, and obviously that's a bluesy song, bluesy influence, and you're a fantastic guitar player, and one thing that people won't know listening to this is uh, that you do all the lead stuff, all the rhythm stuff, rhythm guitar, or do you have another, you have another guitarist as well, don't you? No. No, uh, it's just you. Yeah. Cool. So you, three, bass player, three, three. And, and a drummer. You do a lot of guitar work, and it's fantastic, and it makes the it makes the entire sound a lot bigger. Do if you haven't seen On Quiet Nights, make sure you see them live because you should, and they're they're fantastic. But uh, tell us a little bit about your your roots, and then we also want to talk about um, your recording equipment. But uh, where are your influences, and why are you making sort of indie rock music instead of say blues music? Um, I wasn't really a big collector of what would be called indie rock, so. I'll see to your knowledge that it's indie rock, but it's independent. Oh, I don't. Genres are never have never been my strong suit either. I think <laughs> it's just uh, it's yeah. it's all music to me, really. Yeah. Well, and if you mean indie in terms of independence, yes, yeah, but I'm not really I mean. of the indie scene. If right. if you don't uh, have glo- you don't have glockenspiels or stupid stupid keyboard noises or anything. So. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it, it was a, it was an original concept to begin with. You know, indie music, and then the, the major labels gone in, and it's not independent anymore, and now it means a different thing. But I'm sure you know that too. Yes, we could go but, on uh, for a long. We could have an interview just about that. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Block Party, an independent band, apparently. You know, with whatever seventy grand music videos or whatever it is. But uh, my roots aren't really. I could trace my roots back to probably before independent indie music, that thing became popular. Um, it was 1988, uh, Roy Orbison, HBO special called Black and White Night. And really, I'm just building on what I learned by watching that repetitively every day. <laughs> Roy, yeah. Roy Orbison is truly Roy amazing. Roy Orbison and Friends, yeah, yeah. Springsteen was there, Tom Waits, Elvis Costello, and it was um, James Burton like, um, was playing guitar. And yeah, I just, I just wanted to be that. And I could diverge from what where I learned as a guitar player or a songwriter because they were very different things which which everyone should do I mean you don't necessarily you can listen to music because it's a great guitar player and then listen to music because it's a great songwriter and they're not necessarily always combined so mm-hmm. maybe maybe you can combine them if you if you're an aficionado of both things so Rolling Stones were the first were the band that I got most deeply into and bought every album and learned every song and all of that um Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, kind of, I base all of my, all of my music kind of, musical influences kind of diverged out of the Traveling Wilburys because, you know, it, it was some kind of pop music and I got into that cassette, but then obviously it had Tom Petty and Roy Orbison, mm-hmm. Bob Dylan, um, Jeff Lynne and um, George Harrison. So then, I, you know, I went off and I sort of followed the, the roots backwards to the bands that had gotten those people famous and listened to all the songs. And then it takes you off, you know, even even more diverse influences and um, types of music, country and roots, blues, jazz, soul, all that kind of stuff. 
It's mostly older influence. I mean, you have to adopt certain production values if you want to get ahead now. But really, the songwriting and the lyric, the lyrical themes, that hasn't really been influenced that much by modern music, I don't think. Yeah, that's true. Springsteen's a big one, too. Of course. <laughs> Americana. So it's all, your people are to blame. Yeah. There is a there's a big link between Irish music, especially Irish folk music, and American country and rock and stuff. There's a yeah. there's a big link there. I'm trying to think of the lyrics to American Land. We we built this home on <laughs> the English, the Irish, the Italians, the Germans, and the Jews. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Springsteen has a new um uh, on the new album. There's a song called Death Death to My Hometown. It's a it's an Irish jig kind of, but it's very potent about um the banking crisis and stuff the how it's destroyed his you know metaphorical home time oh yeah of course anyway i must not bog you down no it's all right absolutely i think it's a great time i mean your album um 21st century redemption songs doesn't really get political very much does it uh well it's only social political not party political sure i mean the second album there's already some songs written uh which are closer to the bone okay but that was always a plan because you can't re- you don't really want to alienate people with your first song. Yeah. You know, the every release. So you kind of work into stuff like that. Sure. No, the first album was more about my personal life, the inner people that are directly related to you. And then you start writing outwardly. You know, as you feel you have more reach, or if you feel more people are listening to your music, you're naturally going to start writing in a way which is relevant to more people, to more more universal themes. Well, obviously, the, the album, the first album, is you know, is full of universal themes and, and personal in terms of personal feelings, but it's autobiographical. There you go. A great little segue here. Let's, we're going to listen to "Song of Lust" next for real this time. How does this song fit into the fit into the album, and where did it come from? So it came from the pool of songs that I was writing around two thousand seven, and it fit in because we know we played it with the myself and Roger the drummer and whatever we jammed it out and it fitted in but lyrically it fits in as well because it's autobiographical too so take a listen cool let's hear it it's Song of Lust on Quiet Nights we've got uh, two more songs after this
Once again, if you haven't get, been to UnquietNights.com yet, I think I've said it three or four times. We'll say it again at the end. But that was Song of Lust. The album is 21st Century Redemption Songs. And we are doing the album Omnibus of that particular album. Along here with Luke, haven't reopened or restated the uh, purpose of our playing of all these songs but that's it luke is still along with us and we wanted i wanted to highlight the fact that luke sent over all of the material that came from the album to me earlier late last week and one of the things that i noticed was that you've got a big almost a manifesto about why you did an album and the uh, the importance of albums in this day and age of the, the age of EPs in the age of singles and 99 cent crap on iTunes and all that sort of stuff. So tell us a little bit about why you did an album and how you've woven this all together. As songwriters should be dealing in albums. That's what they always have. And an EP is kind of a disposable thing. It's like being in short trousers still, being viewed as sort of a junior band. It has no real commercial value in EP. I mean, if you kind of... I can see the benefit of it from a time scale point of view. If you want to release something every year and you don't have the money and the time to come up with an album, then an EP can kind of fill the gap and you might make some money off it. But the album is the thing which really survives time mm. and uh, it's it's viewed as a unit. Um, it's still a thing you can charge the most for, you can make the most off, which as an independent band is no, there should be no shame in doing. People still do like to pay for music, but if you want to attract hardcore fans, really an album. An album was a thing that I kind of fetishized over when I was growing up and I collected them, vinyl, cassettes, tapes, everything, and I, I loved holding the artwork and reading the liner notes and reading the track list in the shop and seeing if any of the, the titles really jumped off the page mm. and kind of wanted me to you know, take it home. So I did that with loads of different stuff and the most affection I have for music is still probably an album as a whole. And it was a great decision because this release was possibly going to be an EP at the start money-wise and time-wise we pushed it through and made sure it was an album and um, the songs kind of broadened out they got to be more there are songs which people come up to maybe live and say i really like that one or you know that's my favorite song and it wasn't originally going to be on on said ep hmm. you know so you expand out and you do some more strange things and um i like the format of an album as well because you can still experiment because if you have three or four songs which you're pretty sure are going to get you some exposure you know they're short enough they're all they're fast and they're you know they have hooks in all the right places then they're going to bring attention to you but there are other tracks then that you don't have so much pressure on you can just do what you want and they turn out to be people's favorites you know with the mp3s and stuff file sharing you know they turn out to be people's favorites even if you read the track list someone's love on drugs which is track nine benefited from some you know, freedom to do that and then track 10 is a folk song which you know I wouldn't have done on an EP what, what would be the point <laughs> you can't put all your eggs in one basket and say you know we're going to get famous or whatever off this folk song mm. but if you have kind of the, the other types of songs in place you can expect an album should cover a very very range of topics and, and sounds and subjects that's what makes an album I just love I would campaign for the cause of an album more than anything else. Well, we're, we're glad you did an album. Like you say, some of these songs that are deeper into the album that may not be championed by the golden arm of commercial radio are definitely gems left, the buyer of the album. So, Someone's Love on Drugs. Anything else we should say about this before we play it, Luke? Well, it's certainly not a biographical song, and if you listen to it and keep that in mind, could be a rewarding listen, but I'm really proud of it. You know, the pr production wise, I'm proud of the way it turned out, and we kind of experimented with some other things and overdubbed some timpani hits in the chorus. Mm. And it's sort of a cleaner guitar sound, and uh, it's about something which actually, if you consider that I'm the first person in the song, um, it's, the, it's the first person, the second person, the third person, and the first person narrative is me. Okay. So keep it in mind. Cool. Well, once again. Someone's Love on Drugs. We've got, we got one more song left off 21st Century Redemption songs here with Unquiet Nights. It's Luke and me. Just one more track left after this one. Once again, Someone's Love on Drugs. Just one intro. But they 
got one more song left off the album 21st century redemption songs of course we've been here with luke we've gone through the entire album what a fantastic album it is and made completely independently in bedrooms and i suppose when you guys did the drums you must have had to have been in a proper studio or at least something or how did you do the drums the drums are always the biggest thing to record aren't they um whenever we started the idea of the album we went to earth music in belfast we put down uh, burning the tracks we were the ones should have said silent picture show so we did about five drum tracks and then I kind of took them with me to Liam and hard drive and sort of experimented to oh. try and make them sound better and plugins that sort of thing and eventually got something we were happy with and repeated the process but it was definitely kind of uh, you know this I'm not happy with that snare sound you know we sort of talked about snare sounds forever <laughs> like like all bands probably do but it got into something you know very minute detail about how the snare you know you want to pick up more of the snare rattle on the bottom and you don't want the sort of cutting you don't want the skin you don't want to you know just get the stick on the skin right and on all about you know <laughs> transients and waveforms and it got very 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 scientific and in the, in the end somehow we got it done <laughs> very cool well it's been really fun to go through this with you and uh, just hearing all your diff- the different ways you've done PR and the ways you've recorded it. It's been fun to be on this journey with you from the beginning as well. So I appreciate you including us. We really do wish you the best of luck in the future, Luke. So thanks very, much, very for much And thanks for playing us. It has been a symbiotic relationship. I, th- I think so. And I, I think that um, we've gained, I think we've gained as much or maybe even more than, or not, maybe not more, but certainly as much as you 
and uh, you've sent a lot of your fans over to us, and uh, it's been fun to grow together, shall we say. It certainly has, and I um, hope it continues. Yeah. It's unquietnights.com, and we are talking about the band camp. You've got a band camp profile. Um, yeah. Oh, but if you want to find thing. if you want to find where to buy the album, just go to unquietnights.com forward slash store. All your different links will be there wherever you prefer to buy it. Um, the retailers, iTunes, or Bandcamp, or whatever. Cool. And oh, physical okay. copies too. Don't forget the physical copies. They're going out of. Do you guys have any like T-shirts or hats or anything like that? At the minute, the only thing we have are um, we have pin badge sets. Okay. And uh, physical copies of the album, and we will have T-shirts. Yes. It's essential. Cool. Well, I want one when they're when they're ready. So definitely. Uh, let me for the main show. Perfect. Sounds like a <laughs> sounds like a deal. But cool. Well, thanks thanks again very much, Luke. And um, tell us about the reason you've put this folk song on on last and what it means. Because this this was the this is the last one that I've received before we've done this. So was this yeah. the last one you've recorded? It was. Yeah. It was. It's probably the oldest song that I've written. But it was the first one. Um, it was the first one I've written on the album in two thousand three, I think. I sort of pulled it up again and it was the last one we actually recorded even from the start I wanted to just kind of throw something different in you know a joker in the pack something a bit different they're all mostly electric songs and um, they all have electric guitar and the other ones and I thought well I kind of play with people's I lot give anyone the license to say well this is you know a typical indie rock whatever I just said I'll stop people from doing that and put a, a folk song it's a character piece about one of the world wars and the the first person is in one of the world wars so it's the only song where I'm taking the voice of another person on the album but I took a folk style kind of Django Reinhardt style guitar obviously it doesn't turn out like that I mean you start with the intentions of a uh, folk song but it's you know the lines blur and it starts to sound a bit more like yourself mm-hmm. hope that's been achieved but we did we did some strange things with the drums as well and um got quite a big room sound and compressed it and there's an organ there a b3 organ too oh. Ooh, cool if you haven't bought the album go buy the album i wait patiently for a t-shirt and you're already writing the tracks for the next album looking forward to those as well once again thanks to luke and this is letter from abroad the album is called 21st century redemption songs we do hope you go pick it up at unquietnights.com and uh, we'll see you next time here on <laughs> what's now called Album Omnibuses, but should have a better name at some time in the future. Here on the Justin Wayne Show. Mm-hmm.